Welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Dan Roth. We're going to get into the word of the Lord today. Anybody excited about getting into God's word today? Amen. Now listen, let's talk for a second. You didn't come to hear from me today. Oh, thank God, because I don't have anything to say. You didn't come to hear from a man or a woman, from the young or the old, the black, the white, the brown, or any other color we could imagine. This is not about us hearing the ideas and the philosophies of men. We get enough of that. We get inundated with that. And honestly, let's cut the bull. Let's get down to what God says. So today, as we prepare our hearts to hear from the Holy Spirit, who is the teacher, would you honor the Lord and stand to your feet? I'm going to get down on my knees, and let's go before the Lord together in prayer today. Father, we come to you in the mighty name of Jesus, and Lord, we're so grateful, so honored to be in your presence today, God. Thank you that we get to come into the house of God openly and freely, Lord. Thank you that you've blessed us this day with your presence and your power, God. We're grateful for what you've already done in this church service, but Lord, we don't want to stop there. We want to go deeper. We want to go further with you. And so, Lord, today as we open up your word, we pray that you would open us up to receive it. God, open our eyes to see, our ears to hear our hearts to have a good understanding. May we be the good ground where the word is sown and may it produce something in each and every one of our individual lives. God, how awesome and how wise you are that you can speak a now word to every person in this room. And Lord, we will diligently adhere to it and apply it to our lives. And God, we give you the praise and the glory and the honor for that. Lord, we don't just ask this blessing upon ourselves. Also, we'd ask it for all of our brothers and sisters in the Lord that are preaching and teaching and hearing the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Both here in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet. Lord, there are brothers and sisters. We love them. And no time do we think of ourselves as any better than anybody else. But we see ourselves as co-laborers and workers together in your field, building one kingdom, and that's yours, God. So, Lord, we'd ask that you bless all of our Baptists and Lutheran, Methodists, Episcopalian, Charismatics, Pentecostals, Calvary Chapel. God, we thank you, Lord, that you bless our Adventist brothers and sisters, that you bless our uh, Catholic brothers and sisters, Lord. Bless Harvest and Oak Valley and Oasis, Inland Christian God, the well. Uh, the way, Lord, we thank you, Father God, that you bless Ecclesia and Emmanuel Baptist and Trinity, all the great churches that are out there preaching the gospel, Lord. We bless them this day as you would bless us. In Jesus' mighty name, everybody in agreement said? Amen. Amen. You can have a seat, and as you're having a seat, get your Bible out. So blessed last week, I was able to listen to the live stream and hear uh, Keith Hershey ministering the word of God. Wasn't that a great message last week? So blessed and so encouraged. And I'm just excited that as a church, we get to partner up with ministries like Mutual Faith and the different missionaries that we do have, and we're able to make an impact all over the world. And uh, so good, so good. Last time we were together in Hebrews, we were talking about hope. You remember Pastor Luke's message on hope, just a brilliant understanding and encouraging word. And we're going to continue in those verses, but I want to back up a verse in Hebrews chapter 6, and we'll start in verse number 11. But the title of today's message is Turbo Christians, turbo Christians. You say turbo Christians. What, what do you mean by turbo Christians? What do you mean by turbo? Well, the word turbo comes from the word turbine. And, and when I was thinking about this and looking at this, I, I, I thought about that. And that word turbine is a machine for producing continuous power. Now, just thinking about that got me all excited because as Christians, we don't have a machine. We have the Spirit of God in us that produces continuous power. And so we can be all that God has called us to be. We can do all that God has called us to do. We can overcome. We have the victory already. And, and now we can be turbo Christians. We can have that continuous power in our lives. Now, for every subject that we approach in the Word of God, there's a God side of things, which God supplies the Spirit. God gives us the power. But there's also a man side of things. And so if we're going to be these turbocharged Christians, if we're going to be able to get out on the highway and open it up, pedal to the metal, and take off like God wants us to, we're going to have to do our part. We can't just sit idly by and think that, you know, God gave me the power, therefore stuff's just going to happen as I snooze and as I just, no, you snooze, you lose, right? And so we've got to make sure that we're doing our part when it comes to the things of God. Now with these thoughts in mind, I want you to take a look at Hebrews chapter 6, verse number 11. And verse number 12, take a look at it with me. It says in Hebrews chapter 6, verse number 11, And we desire that each one of you show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope to the end. Everybody say diligence. diligence. Verse number 12, it continues the sentence. Even though it's a new verse, it's the same thought. Take a look at it. It says that you do not become sluggish, but imitate those who through faith and patience 
inherit the promises. Now, that's a great verse, and we want to get into the depths of what that's talking about. We will, but I want to back up into the first part of that verse, verse number 12. Look at what it says, that you do not become sluggish. Everybody say sluggish. sluggish. In modern-day terminology, we would call this lazy. See, that word sluggish for my scholars out there is only used two times in the New Testament, both of them in the book of Hebrews. We've already covered it once when it talked about being dull of hearing. So now he says, we don't want you guys to become dull. We don't want you to become ineffective, unproductive. We don't want you to become sluggish. We don't want you to become lazy. We want you to be diligent, like it said in verse number 11. That's the man side of things. God puts in his part. God gives us the spirit. God gives us the power. God, Jesus said, God gives it without measure. You have a continuous supply and flow of power. But if you don't do anything with it, if you become sluggish and lazy, it's not going to do you any good. It's like a supercharged car sitting in the garage collecting dust. Let that not be our lives, church. God's desire is that we move in his ways, that we go forward with him, that we go faster, that we use that power for what it's meant for. God wants to do great and mighty things on the earth, and he wants to use you, and he wants to use me. And therefore, we need to work together with the Spirit of God and be diligent and not become lazy. Proverbs chapter 15, if you'll turn there with me, we're going to play in the book of Proverbs today. Kind of fun. Love the book of Proverbs. Great wisdom, great things for our lives. Proverbs chapter 15, keeping in mind this example of being a turbo Christian, moving in the ways of God. Proverbs chapter 15 and verse number 19. We're going to launch out from here today. Proverbs chapter 15, verse number 19. Take a look at what it says. Proverbs chapter 15, verse 19 says, The way of a lazy man is like a hedge of thorns. Now, if you've ever been hiking and you've ever gotten lost from the trail, you know what this is talking about because you've gotten off the trail and you found yourself in a place where, wait a second, I I don't know where I'm at anymore and I, I need to find my way back and I think it's over there. And so you start to move in that direction. What happens? There's these bushes, there's thorns, there's different things. Your legs are getting cut. All of a sudden, you're wondering if you got stung by something, right? There, there's different things. You're bleeding and you're like, oh my goodness, this is crazy. See, the way of a lazy man is like a hedge of thorns. It's perplexing. It's hard. It's difficult. And, and, and you're not going to make headway very fast if you're going on that way. But take a look at this. But the way of the upright is a highway. Wow. The way of the upright is a highway. What's a highway? Well, we know the highway, right? They build up and and they make a smooth path. And it's up above all of the hindrances. It's up above all of the problems, the trials, the pressure. And, And it's a smooth road. And you can see for miles. You can see what's up ahead. You can see the turns and the pitfalls. That highway, you can go farther and you can go faster. See, as turbocharged Christians, we're going to work together with God. We can take that highway and you can light it up, right? You can lay the pedal to the metal and you can take off in the direction God has for you. But the way of the lazy man like a hedge of thorns. You're going to have to proceed with caution because it's dangerous, it's difficult, and it's hard. So today I thought it'd be kind of fun to talk about two paths we can choose. There's two paths we can choose. We can choose that path of the lazy, or we can choose the way of the upright. You see, the way of the upright, when you, when you start to work hard, when you start to be diligent, it opens up avenues in your life. Think about it this way. If you've ever traveled a, a, off the beaten path, right? You know that it's difficult. You know that it's tough. And when you take that road, maybe this is the direction God wants you to go. The first time you take it, it is tough. It is hard, right? You're having to push things out of the way. Maybe you're moving a rock. Maybe you're cutting back some sticks, something like that. And and it was tough for you to get there. But you know what? This was the direction God had for you. You took that way of God. And now the next time you travel that same road, what's going to happen? Is it going to be as tough the second time? No, the answer is no. Why? Because you've already walked that way before. You've already gone that way. You know this is the direction. You understand. You see the turns. You see the pitfalls. You've already trodden that down one time. Uh, Let's apply this to our lives in a practical way. Maybe you were believing God for your health. Maybe you came down with a cold or a flu and you just couldn't kick it. And you decided, you know what? If I really do believe this thing, if I really do believe the Bible, I'm going to get healed. And so you start believing God to get healed of this little thing, right? It may be a little thing, but my goodness, it seems like such a big thing. Just can't kick it, can't beat it. You know, you're going to work coughing all over everybody, snotting all over the place. And and you know what? I'm just going to get healed. And so you start to declare the word. It's a tough road. It's a tough path. But you know this is the direction of God. And so you're moving the obstacles out of the way. You're believing God by his stripes. I was healed. And now all of a sudden, your healing manifests. 
wow, here I am. But then the next time you come down that road, maybe it's not a cold or a flu. Maybe it's something like a sinus infection. Maybe it's a diagnosis from the doctor. Maybe it's something even more difficult. But you say, I've already gone down this road. God's already been faithful. I already know the path here in the Word of God, and I know I'm going to get there. See, hard work and diligence opens up avenues in our lives. What about your finances? I love what John D. Rockefeller, you remember John D. Rockefeller? Very wealthy, very rich, and influential man in our nation's history. But he said, I couldn't tithe on the first million dollars I ever made if I hadn't have started tithing on the first weekly wage I made, which was $1.50. See, there was a path. He knew that this was the way of God. And so with that $1.50 weekly salary, he said, I'm going to believe God and I'm going to tithe my 15 cents into the house of God. And so it was tough. It was the way, though, that he knew God had for him. And so he deposited that so that when he traveled that road again and he made his first million dollars, he said $100,000 to give to the kingdom of God? Absolutely. Why? Because he's went down that road before. That hard work, that diligence, going after the things of God paid off in his life. So... Are we going to take the path of the upright, or are we going to take the path of the lazy? Let's examine both paths. Let's start with the path of the lazy. Let's see where that one goes, shall we? The path of the lazy. Now, as I was thinking about the path of the lazy, there's so many verses in the Bible that talk about diligence, talk about hard work, talk about the slothful, talk about the sluggard, lots of great verses to choose from. But I found a group of verses that I, I believe God just laid out beautifully that show us the path of the lazy. And as many of you know in the book of Proverbs, most of these can be taken out just one verse at a time and you can examine them, you can pull from them, we will as we go along today. But as we see them in order today, we're going to see the path of the lazy. Turn with me to the book of Proverbs chapter 26 this time. A couple pages over to Proverbs chapter 26. I love hearing that rustling of paper. Praise the Lord. Proverbs chapter 26, we're going to start in verse number 13. And read through verse number 16. And as we do, we will see the path of the lazy. Proverbs chapter 26, verse number 13 through 16. Starting out in verse number 13, it says this. Look at this. The lazy man says, there's a lion in the road. A fierce lion's in the streets. Verse number 14. As the door turns on its hinges, so does the lazy man on his bed. Verse number 15. The lazy man buries his hand in the bowl. It wearies him to bring it back to his mouth. Number 16, the lazy man is wiser in his own eyes than seven men who can answer sensibly. Wow. Some great verses. You know, you kind of chuckle at some of them. They're kind of funny when you, when you really think about what's being said. But right there in front of us is the path of the lazy. Notice, first of all, that the path of the lazy starts with excuses. It starts with excuses. Verse number 13, the lazy man says, there's a lion in the road. A fierce lion in the streets. What does that say? He's saying, it's time to go to work. I don't want to work, so I'm going to make up an excuse. There's a lion in the road. A fierce lion in the streets. Now, maybe you've known people like this. I know none of you in this room have ever done this, so we're not talking about you right now. We're talking about those other people that, that aren't here today, right? And, and, and those other people that we have all known have said something like this. Yeah, I got that job, but I quit. Why? Because of those people. Or that boss, right? How about this one? People have come to church. Yeah, I, I was going to that church, but I stopped because of those people or that pastor. See, oh, no, it couldn't be your fault. No, there's a lion in the streets. So you, you, what are you going to do? There's a fierce lion in the road. What do you, you, you can't be held responsible. Oh, of course. See, rather than go through the pain of the pressure of the process, they want to stop, and they want to make excuses. And when you find yourself making excuses, it's time to stop and to slap yourself and repent. Why? Because you're on the wrong road. You're on the wrong path. Now you're getting on the path of laziness. Start making excuses. My wife and I, Pastor Jess over here on the front row, my beautiful wife there, uh, we were going to Bible college. We were in the Midwest. We were in the Bible Belt. In fact, we were in the buckle of the Bible Belt. Now, you would expect in the Midwest, in the buckle of the Bible Belt, going to Bible college, that these would be super Christians. These would be the movers, the shakers, the world changers, right? So we're all excited, and we're meeting people, and, and we encountered one older lady that we were talking with, and we were having a good conversation. And she said, where are you guys from? And we said, well, we're from California. 
The moment we said California, it was like a black cloud appeared <laughs> over her head and started to rain and thunder and lightning, and her whole countenance changed. I mean, she went from like this to like this. And she said, California, I used to live there. And we're like, oh my goodness, what happened to this lady in California? <laughs> you know, we love this place. Sunshine State, I mean, Golden State, come on. Greatest place on earth, in my opinion, to live. I've, I've been around the world, but I want to live here. My goodness. And so she, we're thinking, what's, what's wrong? She goes, the devil lives there. <laughs> my wife and I looked at each other and we said, yeah, he does. We're going back to kick his butt out. See, no excuses. There might be a lion in the road, but I'm going to take hold of his beard and I'm going to knock him out. See, I'm not going to let the devil play games with my life. I'm not going to let him stop me from doing the will of God. I'm not going to make excuses. No, I'm going to go through the hard work. I'm going to go through the pain of the process because there's a promise on the other side that I got to get a hold of. Got to work. You notice you're making excuses. It's time to repent and get on with what God wants you to do. The road, the path of the lazy, number one, starts with excuses. Secondly, it goes nowhere. It goes nowhere. Let's take a look at it. Verse number 14, Proverbs chapter 26. You still there? Look at what it says. As a door turns on its hinges, so does the lazy man on his bed. Oh, my goodness. You know what I get a picture of when I think about this? Remember that movie, Ferris Bueller's Day Off? Uh, you do. Okay. Ungodly movie. You all should be watching it. But you remember the scene where he had tied to his doorknob the pulley system and it had the mannequin in the bed, right? And every time somebody would open the door and peek in on him, right? And then leaned over and then they would roll it back and it looked like activity, but nothing was going on. Uh, did you hear what I just said? It looked like activity, but nothing was going on. See, the door turns on its hinges, so the lazy man on his bed. It may look like there's activity. It looks like movement, right? Any hinge, it might even make noise, right? It might squeal when you open and close the door. It looks like it. It sounds like it, but there's really no movement. Does the hinge ever go anywhere? No, it moves. There's activity. There's something happening, you think, but really it's not going anywhere. It stays in the same spot. See, the, the path of the lazy doesn't go anywhere. It might look like activity. It might look like Church attendance might look like prayer, might look like believing God and faith, but then when it really comes down to hard work and diligence, it doesn't go anywhere. People may profess to be Christians, call themselves hard workers, but listen, their definition of hard work doesn't line up with what I see in the Word of God. Are you listening? Somebody might come to you and I believe in God. Oh, bless God. I've been believing. I've been professing the promises. I've been praying. I've been crying. I've been spitting. I've been sweating, right? All that kind of stuff. And you think, wow, praise God. You know, I'll, I'll believe with you, you know? And you, you just want to get on their bandwagon because, my goodness, it looks like activity. But then you start to say, well, what have you done about that? You, oh, no, I'm just believing God. We haven't, we haven't done anything yet. Well, you mean you haven't talked to him? You haven't gone after it? You haven't got the job? You haven't started? Well, I mean, what are we doing here? It looks like activity, but it's not going anywhere. See, the path of the lazy starts with excuses, but goes nowhere. Thirdly, the path of the lazy starves. It starves. Uh, verse 15 says it one way, but take a look at Proverbs 19, 24 up on the overheads. A lazy man buries his hand in the bowl and will not so much as bring it to his mouth again. See, in Proverbs 20. 6.15 is said that it wearies him to bring it back to his mouth. This one says it will not, he will not even so much as bring it to his mouth again. I, I get a picture of some guy sitting on the couch watching television, big old belly, kind of like a Homer Simpson type. You know what I'm saying? And, and, and that's another ungodly show you sh shouldn't be watching, okay? And so here he is, and, and he's got the bowl of chips on his belly watching TV. And what does he do? He buries his hand in the bowl then he's thinking, my goodness, it's just so tough to bring that chip back to my mouth. I have it. I want it. I, I'd love to eat it, but you know what? I'm just too tired right now. It's kind of a funny image from the Word of God. What's happening? Oh, they may have their hand on something. Yeah, they might attend church. They might pray before meals. They might listen to Christian radio on the way to work, but they never bring it to their 
mouth. What does that mean? They never partake. They never feed on the word. They never really take it in. They never really draw their nourishment from it. They don't draw their strength from it. Their life is not dependent on it. No, they've got their hand on it. They're touching it. It looks like they've got the right thing, but they don't ever feed on the word of God. See, if the word of God is on our lips, if we can get it in us, if we can feed on it and we can get it down into our heart, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks and we start to stand, we start to declare what's on the inside of us, we draw our power from it, we start to speak the word of God and now all of a sudden it changes the world that we live in. Now all of a sudden your life will change, you will be a witness, you'll be a testimony of who God is. But it starves if you don't lift it up, if you don't draw your nourishment from it. It starves us of our spiritual life. What else does it starve us? Well, it starves us of wealth. See, laziness will starve you of wealth. Proverbs 13, 4 says, The soul of a lazy man desires and has nothing, but the soul of the diligent shall be made rich. Oh, see, a lot of people want to be rich. A lot of people want wealth, right? But not a lot of people want to work to get it. People want this get-rich-quick, overnight success type thing. Listen, that doesn't happen. Can we be real for a second? It takes hard work, it takes honesty, it takes integrity, it takes perseverance, it takes patience, it takes godliness, it takes a long time. Hello. Because the Bible says little by little do we store up. And the Bible says there is a seed, time, and then harvest. See, there are times and season. You take a look at Isaac. What did he do? There was a time of famine. No one wants to sow seed in famine. They want to hold on to their seed in famine. Why? Because we may need to eat this to get us through. And so what do they do? They hold on to their seed. But here's Isaac, and he had a relationship with God. And he had something on the inside of him that said, I'm going to go and I'm going to work hard. And so he plowed up fallow ground, stony ground, hard ground. No one wants to plow in a time of famine. Probably hot Probably terrible conditions, probably really hard, probably the oxen that were plowing were tired because they hadn't really eaten that much, and so it took longer than it normally should have. And yet he still plowed, he still sowed, and the Bible says that he began to prosper until he continued to prosper until he became very prosperous. See, everybody wants to be very prosperous, but do you want to go out in the middle of the heat of the day and do you want to take longer than it should take and do more than you should do in order to get to that promise of God? See, that's one of the things that the path of the lazy will do. It will starve you of wealth. Well, what else does it starve us of? It starves us of life. Proverbs 21, 25 says, the desire of the lazy man kills him for his hands refuse labor. See that one, I want to be rich, I want to be wealthy, I want to be blessed, I want to have a great marriage, I want to have great kids, but I can't do it. It will starve you of real life. God has a life so great in store for you. God has plans for you. God has wants and desires for you, and you may have desires. You might have vision, you might have dreams, and you might have goals, but if you refuse to labor, it'll kill you. It will quench your spirit, it will quench your heart, and it will eventually starve you to death, and you're going to die on the vine. But it doesn't have to be that way. Let's take a look at the end of the path. The end of the path. Where does the path of the lazy end? Well, it ends in pride. It ends in pride. Proverbs 26, 16 says, The lazy man is wiser in his own eyes than seven men who can answer sensibly. What does that mean? That means you could line up seven men. All seven of these men have wisdom, and they've got the life to back it up. Their lives are exemplary. Their family's in order. Their life is in order. Their finances are in order. Everything in their life is good, and they're doing well, and they're, they're making things happen, right? They're diligent. And all seven of these men could have the same heart, the same mind, and be speaking the same thing, and the lazy man will come up and say, what are they saying? Hard work? Hmm. They're all crazy. I can't believe everybody on the planet's crazy. We don't need to work that hard. You don't need to do anything, right? And they dismiss them, and they're wiser in their own eyes than seven men who can answer sensibly. See, the path of the lazy ends in pride. And we all know from the Bible that pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a great fall. What does that mean? That means that this path that leads to pride ends in failure. It ends in failure. If that's the path you're on today, it's time to change. It's time to turn from that path. It's time to get on the right path because you don't want to fail. 
Listen, as a pastor, I don't want you to fail. My job is to equip you to do the work of the ministry, to get busy with the things of God. And therefore, today, I'm here to tell you, you don't have to fail. You don't have to go down that path. Why? Because there was two paths we were talking about today, right? One is the path of the lazy. The other one is the path of the upright. Let's take a look at it together, the path of the upright. Let's go back real quick. Real quick, let's go back to Proverbs chapter 15, verse number 19. Proverbs chapter number 15, verse number 19 says, The way of the lazy man is like a hedge of thorns. Now, I want you to notice something. I want you to notice that it says, The way of the lazy man is like. Everybody say, is like. That means that he's making a comparison. This is a similitude. He's showing something. It is like a hedge of thorns. So when we're on that path, we're going to fail. Why? Because it's like a hedge of thorns. But really, it's much worse than that. Well, look at the rest of the verse. It says, But the way of the upright is... A highway. Now, did you catch it? Notice what it didn't say. It didn't say that the way of the upright is like a highway. No, it said it is a highway. So what is God saying to us? God is saying that if we are going to be turbo Christians, if we're going to take this path, that it's not like a hedge of thorns. It's much worse than that. No, it's not just like a highway. It is a highway. You're going to be able to open it up. You're going to be able to go the direction God wants you to go. You're going to be able to do what God has called you to do. You will travel in that direction faster and farther than you ever dreamed imaginable because you have a source of power that never runs dry. Are you listening today? Praise the Lord. God is good. So the path of the upright, let's take a look at the path of the upright and the time that we have left today. The path of the upright, first of all, takes the highway. The path of the upright takes the highway. Now, notice I've got up on the overheads and little quotations, the highway. Of course, this is a play on words because this is the, the highway. The, the way of the upright is a highway. And so we're going to take the highway. Now, we know in our modern day terminology that we talk about the low road, but I'm going to take the high road. What does that mean? That means that, you know what? You're going to use and abuse me. I'll take the high road. I'm not going to use you and abuse you back. I'm not going to do eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. No, that's all gone, Jesus said. You've heard that said, but I say, someone demands your outer coat, give him your tunic also. Someone asks you to go a mile, you go the extra mile with him, right? We all know that terminology. That's biblical terminology. And so we're not going to take the low road. We're not going to operate the way this world operates. We're not going to cheat. We're not going to defraud. We're not going to manipulate. No, we're going to give what's expected and over and above that. Why? Because God will repay. God will take care of my needs. God sees, God knows, and at the end of it all, God will settle accounts, and I don't mind if you take more money, I don't mind if you take more time, I don't mind if you take more energy, why? Because God will repay, God's got my back, he's looking out for me, I don't have to gossip, I don't have to backbite, I don't have to be a jerk, I can take the highway, I can take the highway, Romans chapter 12, let's go to the New Testament now, this is where we live today, Romans chapter number 12. The Apostle Paul is writing to the Roman church, and he just gets finished telling them to present their bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable before God, which is their reasonable service. It's their spiritual act of worship. Don't be conformed to this world. Don't do things the way that don't just fit in, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now, he starts to give them some various different instructions and things like that. Romans chapter 12, we're going to take a look at two verses, verse number 10. And verse number 11. Romans chapter 12, verse number 10, starting out says this. Be kindly, affectionate to one another with brotherly love. In honor, giving preference to one another. You know what he just said? He just said, I want you to operate in God's ways, not this world's ways. The world bites and devours, gossips, backbites, stabs people. It, it, it kicks them while they're down. I don't want you guys to do that. I want you guys to be kind. I want you to be affectionate to one another. I want you to have brotherly love. Definition of love here at this house is personal self-sacrifice for the betterment of someone else. It's no longer my needs at your expense. Now it's your needs at my expense. See, we're going to go the extra mile for people. We're, we're going to, hey, you want to use me? doesn't matter. God will take care of me. You want to abuse me? Yeah. Listen, we're not going to be a doormat. We'll tell you like it is, and, and we're not going to continue in that. But listen. Our heart is right before God, and we're going to love people. And look at what it says, in honor, giving preference to one another. You know what that means? That means that when you're down there at the cafe, hey, you, you go ahead and mind. No, it's fine. Just you go ahead. Go ahead. Come on. 
You know what that means? That means that when you're out there and you see somebody and they look at you and smile, you smile back. Hey, love you. Glad you came to church today. You know what that means? That means that when you're exiting the parking lot and there's a big old line and it comes to a Y together and you're sitting there, you say, you go first. No, 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 you go first. No, you go first. No, you. And then tonight at 6 o'clock, you can just come on back in, all right? <laughs> Praise the Lord. Now, look at the next verse because the thought is not done yet. There's not a period. But even though it goes into a new verse, it's still the same thought. Look at this. Not lagging in diligence. In other words, you need to love and don't let up. Not lagging in diligence. Fervent in spirit. Serving the Lord. And the thoughts continue on. And you can read that for yourself. But look at what he's saying. He says, I want you to not back down. Path of the upright is diligent. Path of the upright takes hard work. It takes hard work to love people. Oh, we know that. My goodness, don't we know that with our relatives? Don't we know that with our neighbors? My goodness, when they're up in the middle of the night keeping you up. <laughs> takes time, takes hard work, takes pressure. Takes being defrauded sometimes, being used sometimes. Yes, but listen, God will repay. And therefore, we entrust it to God and we love people beyond that. And so he says, don't let up. Continue to take the highway. Well, what, what else? The path of the upright, what else? Secondly, rules from above. Rules from above. You say, what does that mean? Well, think about a highway for a second. Uh, presently, if you, if you drive around and you see some of the highways they're building, my goodness, they've got these massive roads that are going up. And it seems like they go on for miles, these overpasses and stuff like that. I mean, you drive underneath them and you think, my goodness, the, the Empire State Building couldn't be that tall, some of them. You're driving around. You're just driving to San Diego and going through Temecula. They have one off-ramp that is like going like a siege ramp. I'm like, my goodness, they must be taking the city right there because right up there, you drive up on top of that, you've got a commanding view of the city. And, and, and many of us know that in war times, if you had the high ground, you had an advantage, right? Because they were doing an uphill battle, but you could just take them out this way, okay? And so when we take the highway, when we take the way of the upright, not the lazy way, we can rule from above. The Bible says that we are currently seated with Christ in heavenly places. The Bible says that all things are under his feet. And did you know that you're the body of Christ? And now as you diligently keep yourself in the love of God and in the ways of God and you're diligent about the things of God and now you are working out in life, you are no longer a slave. No, you're a son or daughter. And now you rule and reign with Christ in this life. Let's take a look at it in Proverbs chapter 12, verse number 24. Look at what it says. It says, the hand of the diligent will rule. But the lazy man will be put to forced labor. Oh, wow. That means that that path of laziness, remember, I talked about it ends in failure. You're going to end up doing stuff you don't want to do. Forced labor is not fun. It's not nice. You're going to hate yourself. You're going to hate the people around you. It ends in failure. But when you're diligent, the Bible says that the hand of the diligent will rule. Well, let's apply that to our lives. Let's see how that works out in our life. See, I will not be made a slave to the devil. He used to be our father. That's what Jesus said. We used to be of our father, the devil. But now we've got a new family. We've got a new nature. And no longer do we obey the devil and his ways and his will. We're no longer under his sway. We're no longer chumps and, and, and just peasants for him to, to rule and to move around like pawns. No, I'm not going to be the devil's pawn. I'm not his puppet. Listen, I rule with Christ now. And devil, you come knocking at my door. I'm going to remind you of your place. You're under my feet. The Bible says that God will soon crush Satan underneath your feet. Wow. That means that you don't have to put up with the devil and his stuff anymore. He starts shooting arrows at you. You lift your shield of faith and you believe God. You pull out the sword of the spirit and you be diligent about it. Fight hard and don't let up. Some of you guys are getting this. What else does it mean? It means you don't have to be a slave to sin. You've been freed from sin. Listen, that old man that used to do that old stuff, that perverse stuff, that dirty stuff, that shameful stuff, when it comes up again, when those thoughts creep in again, when the opportunities present themselves again, you don't have to be a slave. 
But if you're lazy and you just float through life and say, oh, well, whatever happens, you know, I guess I'm always this way and this is just how I am, you know. Listen, the Bible says the dog returns to its own vomit. You're not a dog. You're a child of God. And now you can stand up against that junk and you can say, I've been freed from sin. I am holy as he is holy. I flee youthful lust. I pursue righteousness, faith, and peace with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Start to get after it. Be diligent. Don't put yourself in a position where you will be made a slave to any. How how, how about this? You can be a slave to money? Huh? Listen, San Bernardino, our city's bankrupt, and they're saying we can't do stuff because there's no money. Is that how the church operates? Are we under the system of mammon? Are are we going to be ruled by money? Who's to tell us we can't do what God has called us to do because you don't have any money? I don't care if I have money. I got God on my side. God will provide. I will not be brought into bondage of money. You start to declare, I'm going to bring my tithe. I'm going to believe God. God will supply all of my need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. I'm going to work hard on the job. I'm going to get a promotion. I'm going to be the ruler at my job. I'm going to work hard. I'm going to serve that ungodly man. Even though I don't like him, I love him in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's, I'm going to have favor on the job. I'm going to get increased. I'm going after it. I'm going to be diligent. And God will provide. Listen, I'm not going to neglect my tithe just because I'm bringing my freedom for our future offering. I'm going to believe that. I'm going to bring my tithe. And God will supply over and above for that offering he's called me to bring. I will not be ruled by money. Oh, come on, somebody. Come on. Listen, if you've been in fear about your finances, it's time for you to shout right now. I will not be ruled by money. (laughs) Hallelujah. Give the Lord a praise. this works in every area of your life. If you're diligent about your marriage, you will rule in your marriage. If you're diligent about your children, you will rule in your family with your children. doesn't mean you will dominate them and lord over them. That's not what I'm talking about. You will rule. You will reign. You'll have a great family. Have a great marriage. Have a great home. Have a great influence in the community. Have a great witness when it comes to telling people about Jesus. It works in every area of your life when you take the way of the upright. Path of the upright, number one, takes the highway. Number two, rules from above. Last thing for today doesn't fail. Oh, I like this one. It doesn't fail. See, we're so afraid of failing in life. But listen, even if you may, the Bible says if a righteous man falls seven times, he will be raised back up again. My goodness. Your path doesn't end to destruction like the path of the lazy. It doesn't end to forced labor and failure. No, the path of the upright doesn't fail. Show me the book of 2 Peter. There in the New Testament, 2 Peter, right after the book of Hebrews, you'll find James, 1 Peter, and then 2 Peter. Peter's writing to the church abroad. As he writes, he starts to give some, some last thoughts, some final thoughts, because he, he's, he's been told by the Lord that he's soon going to be with him. He's soon going to take off the tent of the body that he's in and put on eternal life. And so as he's there writing to the church, he's writing to Christians, Now he's got some thoughts for them. And he says, I want you to be diligent about some things. I want you to add to your faith, goodness, and goodness, knowledge, knowledge, self-control, self-control, perseverance, perseverance, godliness, godliness, brotherly kindness. And to brotherly kindness, I want you to add love. See, that's the end result. That's the goal for us as Christians. And so he says, I want you to be diligent about these things. Add these things to your life. Do these things. Incorporate them. Work them in. Be diligent about them. And then he continues on in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse number 10. Take a look at it with me. And he says, therefore, brethren... Be even more diligent. Everybody say more diligent. More diligent. Oh, come on. You've got to say it passionately. Say more diligent. more diligent. See, he says as if it wasn't enough. You've got to be diligent, but you've got to be more diligent about this. Just when you thought the hard work had finished, you ended from your, no, uh, 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 uh. Don't let up. Don't back down. It's time to put in for the extra mile. He says, I want you to even be more diligent. What about to make your call and election sure? Now, now wait a second. Hold on, Pastor. I thought that when we got saved, that's all there was, and we didn't have to do anything else. I thought Jesus was just going to draw us through this life. We could float down the lazy river of life and end up in heaven, and it would all be bells and whistles. Listen, you might make it to heaven that way, maybe. Uh, I'm not sure if that's your attitude if you really are saved. You know, I'd have to question that. I'd have to wonder about that. But let's say you did get there. I I wonder what the words of God to be. He might say, well, done, you know. 
But I don't want that sort of an answer from God. I want well done, good and faithful servant. I want you worked hard and you labored, and look, here is the reward of your labors. Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your Lord. See, that's the kind of life I want to live. So he says, be even more diligent to make your call and election. Sure, we've already covered this. You don't work to get salvation. You work from your salvation. Because you're saved, you want to go out there and do great and mighty things with God. You're a turbo Christian, supercharged with an abundant supply of power. Now look at what the rest of the verse says. For if you do these things, what things? Things that we discussed before, things that he told them to add to their life, things that he told them to be diligent about. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. You will never stumble. Can I tell you something? That is quite a promise from the word of God. None of us want to fall. None of us want to fail. None of us want to stumble. But he says, if you do these things, if you stay after them, if you work hard, don't get lazy, don't get sluggish, don't slack off, but diligently adhere to the things that you have heard in the word of God, the things that you have known, the things that you have seen. He says, if you do these things, you will never stumble. What does that mean? That means that on the highway, there's no obstacles. It means that there's no potholes. God has filled them all in. Are, are there problems and pressures and trials and things that you're going to encounter? Sure, you're going to see those things. You're going to encounter those things, but God has taken care of them by the Spirit of God, and you can handle them as you work hard in the way of the Lord, diligently doing what God has called you to do. What did we learn today? Well, we saw two paths that we can take. Path of the lazy, which starts with excuses, goes nowhere, starves us, finally ends in pride, which leads to failure. But what about the highway? What about the path of the upright? Well, the path of the upright takes the highway. It rules from above, and it doesn't fail. If you got something from God today, come on, give God a great big praise. Woo! Hallelujah. God is so good. You guys have been great today. I want to thank you guys for allowing me to speak that word into your life. Let's not stop there, though. It's been a great time in praise and worship, great time together in the word. We laugh together. My goodness, we've had a good time. Let's not stop there. Let's make sure that before you leave this place that your heart's right with God and that if you died, you wouldn't end up in hell, that you'd go to heaven. Say, Pastor, harsh. Man, my goodness, why are you talking about hell? I don't believe in hell. Well, that's a convenient thought, but do you know that just by ignoring something and denying its existence doesn't make it go away? I could say I don't believe in semi trucks. Go stand on all the slow lane of the freeway. I'll meet one face to face sooner or later. Listen, the Old and New Testament talk about hell. Jesus spoke about hell. And so it's a very real place that we need to make sure that you don't go. Why? Because you don't want to go there. I don't want you to go there. God doesn't want you to go there. It was never intended for you and I, made for the devil and his angels that rebelled. We can choose with our life the path that we take, whether heaven or hell. And so come on, listen up. Give me some of your attention. Sometimes people say, well, all roads lead to heaven, Pastor. I don't have to worry about that. I just stick to my truth. You stick to your truth. God sees that and lets anybody into heaven that, that stays to their own thing. Well, that's an interesting thought. But you know that nowhere in the Bible say you can just take any road and that leads to heaven? It's like saying all roads lead to the moon. Mm -mm. The only one way you're going to get there. You can drive around as long as you want and you'll never make it. Jesus came and he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man goes to the Father except by me. What does that mean? That means it's God's heaven. You're going to have to get there God's way. Can't get there your way or my way or some well-meaning church committee's way. Got to get there God's way. Don't you think God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, the one who wrote the plan of redemption, carried out in his son, don't you think that if he went to the cross, beaten, bloody, a spectacle for all to see? Don't you think that if he did all that, he would tell us how to get to heaven? Well, he does in his word. He says, you must be born again. Now, I know our society's made a mockery out of that term. They've raked it through the coals. They made it out to be something that it's not. But this is not about what society or movies or television or books say. Internet and blogs and that sort of a thing. Come on, give me a break. What does the Bible say about being born again? Well, it's always meant the same thing. Beginning of the Bible... To the end of the Bible, it means that you've given God all of your heart and that you've given God all of your life. Just that simple. It's all or nothing with Jesus Christ. And you can't do enough good, can't attend enough church, can't get involved enough to work your way into heaven. The Bible says that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You're not going to make it on your own merit. You can't do enough. You can't uh, think enough. You can't know enough scriptures or quote enough scriptures or any of that kind of stuff because the devil can quote scriptures. He's not a Christian headed for heaven. Demons know who Jesus is, and that doesn't qualify them for heaven. So it's not about what you have in your head, and it's not about your religious activity, but rather this is about your heart. Have you given God all of your heart, and have you given God all of your life? 
If not, I love you enough today to tell you the truth. You're not going to make it. Jesus said these words. He said, when I come, I want to find you hot or I want to find you cold because if I find you lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. Those are pretty graphic, gross words for the mouth of Jesus, but what's he saying? Lukewarm. What's that all about? Well, it's a little in, little out, little up, little down, a little token prayer every now and then, an occasional church attendance. God is something in your life, but he's not everything, and you're not opposed to God, but you're not wholehearted for God. Listen, if that's your relationship with Jesus Christ, look out. Why do I say that? Because only people that are not real Christians will be ejected and rejected from the body of Christ. So today, I'm going to give you an opportunity in a moment. If you haven't yet given God all of your heart and all of your life, and you know you haven't, you need to do it. I'm going to give you the opportunity to do just that. I'm going to count to three just like this. One, two, three. Bang! Pop my hands together. When you hear the sound of my hands popping together just like that, bang! That's your opportunity to raise your hand. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, I want to give God all my heart. I want to give God all my life. I want to be born again, headed for heaven, denying my presence in hell. I'll see your hand go up. I'll count it. You can put it right back down. You say, whoa, 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 wait a second, Pastor. If I raise my hand, I'll be embarrassed. Mm -hmm. You might be. Let's get over that embarrassment today. Think of the trade-off. Isn't it better to be embarrassed for a moment than it is to be in hell forever and ever and ever? Uh, no one would make that trade. And yet the flesh is going to try and talk you out of it. You'll be embarrassed. The devil's going to try and talk you out of it. You're not worthy. Come on. Come on. God wants you to do this. We're all rooting for you. Probably won't even be embarrassed, but even if you are, it's better than ending up in hell. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father who is in heaven. But if you deny me, I will deny you. So today, your call, your choice. Will you give God all of your heart and all of your life or sit there and do nothing when you know you need to get right? Your call. God's already done his job sending Jesus, beaten, bloody, hung on a cross. I've done my job by telling you the truth and loving you enough to not play games today. Now it's your turn. Will you give God all of your heart? Will you give God all of your life? Who should raise their hand in a moment? You've been running from God instead of two. God, I'm speaking to you. Who should raise their hand if you're not sure about your salvation? Come on today, make sure. Who should raise their hand if you've never done this, never said yes to Jesus, giving them all of your heart and life? Come on, I'm speaking to you. Or finally, who should raise your hand if you're lukewarm in this place? You know that's the condition of your heart when I described it. Come on, you can make a right relationship with Jesus, acknowledging your need for him by raising your hand in a moment. All across this auditorium, back in the family rooms, wherever you're at, watching my television, the foyer, the Love Rock Cafe, or online around the world, God sees and God knows you can raise your hand right where you're at. I'm going to count to three, pop my hands together. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Here we go. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Just raise them up high for me. Thank you. There's one, two, three, four, five. Thank you. God bless you. Six up on top. Got gotcha. you. Seven up here. Thank you. Eight, nine. Thank you. Ten. God bless you. Got two hands up. Praise the Lord. Eleven, twelve. Thank you. Thirteen up top. Fourteen, fifteen. Got gotcha, you guys. In the family room, sixteen, seventeen. Got gotcha. you. 18 over here. Thank you. God bless you. On this side, 19, 20. Thank you. 21 up on top. 22. Got gotcha you over there. 23 over here. Thank you. God bless you. Anybody else real quick? 23 wise people. Where are you at up on top? Just give me a little wave if that's you. Praise God. Anybody else real quick? Over here. Over here. My goodness. Everybody's pointing this way. Got you right there, man. All right. Praise the Lord. About 23, 24 people. Where are you at number 25? You're sitting there wondering if you should do this. Come on, man. You should. Go for it. Come on, woman. Go for it. If that's you, God's speaking, you're tugging at your heart. Come on, just pop your hand up right now. Anybody else real quick? Where are you at, number 25? Number 25, you're sitting there wondering if you should do this. Yeah, you should. Let's go for it. I didn't embarrass them, and I won't embarrass you. Anybody else real quick? Come on, number 25. Thank you, number 25. Got you right there. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise today. <laughs> Hallelujah. God is so good to us. All 25 of you, or if you're number 26, 27, 28, you should have raised your hand, but you didn't. It's not too late. Here's what I want you to do real quick. We're all going to stand. We're all going to give a clap and a shout as we do. Get your stuff, whatever you brought with you to church. Get a friend if you need a friend. Get in the aisle and meet me up front because we're going to change destinies today. But we can't do that until we get you down here. So if that's you, you should raise your hand. You should have raised your hand. No one leaves. You come right now. Come on down. Come on down. They're coming. Let's give them a hand. You can come too. This is your time. This is your moment. Hallelujah. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. You can come too. Come on. This is your time. Come on down. Come on down from the families. Bring your children. They'll remember this. Come on. can come too. Even if you didn't raise your hand, just get in the aisle. Come on. 
Nudge your neighbor, say, come on, friend, I'll go with you. Come on, come on, come on. Come in, come on, you can come too. We got room for you up here. We got room for you up here. Come on, come on, come on. Everybody up front, take a look up here. Take a look up here. Put a big smile on your face. This is a good thing. This is not a bad thing. Came to give God all of your heart. Came to give God all of your life. I want to introduce you guys to a friend of mine right over here in the gray jacket. See this guy waving at you? That's Pastor Joel. He's a really good guy. Nothing weird's going to go on. I'm going to let you know what he's going to do in advance so that you're not wondering and afraid, okay? First thing he's going to do, he's going to pray for you, a simple prayer to invite Jesus into your heart, okay? Second thing he's going to do is give you some free stuff, some free literature or pastor growth. I'll help you to find out what to do next in your walk with God. Then finally, he's going to give you a friend that we have in the church that we like to call a spiritual personal trainer. Listen, your best friends are ahead of you in this church. Spiritual personal trainer is a friend who will help you to get strong in the ways of the Lord so you don't go back serving the devil that you go on with God diligently doing the word of God and that your life is blessed. You don't stumble like we talked about today, okay? It's easy, it's free, and you need to do it. He'll describe how it works and then he'll let you go. Now listen, let me make a promise to you guys, okay? Give us one year of your life here at this church, sitting under the word of God here at the Rock Church World Outreach Center. One year. At the end of that year and for the rest of your life, you'll just say, man, I'm so blessed. I never knew it could be this good. Am I telling the truth, everybody? All right, so if you guys will make a left turn, follow Pastor Joel right this way. Let's give him a hand as they go. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big prayer. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent him for me and that he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin, and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again, I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Bye-bye.